Okay, let's begin. So, hello and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. We've got a lot to get through today, and during the next hour, you'll learn all about Amazon Light Sail containers, which is considered the easy way to run your containers in the cloud. You'll be introduced to the Light Sail service and understand how simple it can be to deploy your containerized applications using Light Sail. Now, the use of containers has increased exponentially over the years. They are very quick to deploy, they're portable and cost efficient. And with the, the recent integration with LightSail, the deployment process is even easier. Now on the panel with me here today, um, I'm happy to introduce Jerry Hargrove from AWS, who is an Amazon LightSail developer advocate. You may know him as the guy who creates cloud diagrams and notes at awsgeek.com. Uh, such as the one you see here for LightSail. So, hello, Jerry. Thank you very much for joining me on this call today. How are you doing? Good morning, Stuart. Great, doing great. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about LightSail containers from yourself today. Uh, I know a bit about LightSail itself, but not so much on the container side. So, I'm interested to hear what you have to tell us and show us. But before I hand over to Jerry to give the agenda for today, I just want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and you will all receive a link to it as soon as it's been published. Also, before I forget, if you do have any questions throughout, please use the chat window and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the Q&A section at the end. Okay, that's probably enough from me now. So let me pass the reins over to you, Jerry, to, to show us the agenda for today and what we're going to go through. All right, Stuart, thanks a lot. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today are, are really three things. Uh, we're, we'll focus on light sail containers, um, but I'm gonna start with an introduction to Amazon light sail to give you a little background and a little context um, behind light sail and the philosophy of light sail in general. Then I'll talk about light sail containers specifically. And then finally today, I'll show a couple of demos uh, just to demonstrate some of the features and capabilities of of uh, light cell containers. So with that, let's go ahead and and get started. So Amazon Light Sail is a uh, virtual private server. You can think of it as a, a virtual private server in the cloud. And we designed it from the beginning to be the easiest way to get started on AWS for for developers, or maybe you're a small business or a student, um, or someone else who just needs to build a solution on the cloud and host it on the cloud. Uh, Pro LightSail provides you with uh, compute, storage, and networking capacity, and the ability to deploy and manage websites really easily in the cloud. With LightSail, you can uh, launch a website in minutes. Uh, it's ideal for um, uh, simple workloads, quick deployments, uh, or for somebody who's getting started on AWS. It's designed really to help you start small and then scale as, as you grow. It makes it really easy to automatically uh, configure networking access, security environments, takes a lot of the guesswork out of launching your server. Um, LightSail has a simple and flexible API if you want to access it from that direction, or like I'm going to show today, you'll be able to see that you can really easily do things in LightSail and LightSail container specifically through the web console. Every LightSail server comes with a high-performing, persistent uh, SSD-based storage idea, and it's designed to help you scale as, as you grow. As your ideas grow, you can add features like load balancers and CDNs, et cetera, to help that uh, grow with you. LightSail uh, is bundled in uh, convenient plans that give you predictable pricing. Um, it includes a virtual server, a fixed amount of memory or RAM, uh, compute, SSD-based storage, and a free data transfer allowance. LightSail plans also provide you with a static IP address, DNS management, and you're charged on an hourly 
or on-demand basis, similar to other AWS services and features. So you only pay for light sale uh, plans when you're actually using them. Light sale also provides you with a very easy way to get up and running very quickly. Uh, we have a number of pre-configured one uh, one-click launch applications and developer stacks. Uh, you can start with something as simple as an operating system like Windows Server or Linux, uh, flavor of Linux like Ubuntu or CentOS, and you can use that operating system, install software, build your instance as you see fit. Um, or you can pick a blueprint that already has a pre-packaged application on it. One of our most popular is WordPress. So if you want to stand up a, a WordPress blog, for, for example, and want LightSail to manage all of the underlying infrastructure for you while you go in and manage the blog itself, it's really easy to come in, spin up a LightSail WordPress instance very quickly, and literally be online and available within, within minutes. You can also pick uh, developer stacks uh, if that suits your need, like a, a simple LAMP stack or a Node.js stack or any uh, a number of other types of applications and, and dev stacks. In addition to the basic uh, virtual private server, Amazon LightSail uh, also Helps, helps you grow as your needs and, and your businesses grow. Um, we've provided a, a host of other features to help your light cell experience grow, including uh, databases, uh, content delivery networks, load balancers, uh, we do DNS management for you, and, and containers, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Uh, so I wanna briefly talk about some of these other features and, and then we'll move on to containers. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is managed databases. Uh, with Amazon LightSail, you may only need a, a LightSail instance, a virtual private server, but there may be times, or there may be a time when you want to, gr when you grow beyond that and you need a separate database, either for scalability purposes or security purposes. You can launch a fully configured uh, MySQL or Postgres database in minutes and then have LightSail do all of the management and maintenance for you. This is nice because it then allows you to scale your database independent of your uh, virtual private servers, um, helps improve the availability of your applications by decoupling your application from the database, or you could just simply want to run a standalone database in, in the cloud. Um, this helps you build, for example, multi-tiered applications running multiple instances, for example, that connect to a, a central database. And like LightSail instances, uh, LightSail managed databases come in plans that bundle together memory processing, storage, and data transfer into a, another predictable monthly price. Uh, in addition to managed databases, we also provide load balancing for you that allows you to route web traffic across your instances so that your websites or your applications can accommodate you know, variations in traffic or be better protected from outages and at the, all at the same time deliver a, a very seamless experience for your visitors or for your, for your customers. These load balancers also include integrated uh, certificate management, uh, which provides free SSL and TLS certificates that you can provision and add to a load balancer in just a couple of clicks. You can then request and manage additional certificates directly from the uh, LightSail console. So really quickly, you can, in just a couple of clicks, set up a load balancer that handles HTTP, HTTPS traffic um, with the ability to easily add and remove LightSail instances um, once you have that in place. Also, we provide uh, the LightSail content delivery network distributions. This makes it really easy for you to accelerate delivery of content that's hosted on your LightSail resources by storing it and serving it on Amazon's uh, global delivery network, which is powered by Amazon CloudFront. Some of you may be familiar with that. 
Um, this helps you, you know, enables your website to support HTTPS traffic, um, cloud, the uh, content delivery network supports uh, SSL certificate creation and hosting, and can also reduce the load on your LightSail instances themselves. So instead of requests going all the way back to your LightSail instance, the content delivery network can deliver content to your customers where they're at. And it, like is all, it, sorry, Jerry, just to just to jump mm -hmm. in quickly. Um, is yeah. it fair to say that kind of light sour helps with building some of those best practices in by default um, as as part of the package? Absolutely. I, light sale is all of those best practices and all of the um, learnings that we have and have built with our customers wrapped up into a simple solution that then you can take and use very easily. Excellent, thank you. You bet. Um, and, and content distribution networks, like other features, come with a bundled monthly pricing. And that's one of the things that is really important in LightSail is that uh, pricing for these features is uh, very predictable. So you know exactly what you're going to be spending each month. Uh, and, and finally, the, I think the, the last one I want to talk about is uh, block storage. So these are, these are all uh, features that are intended to help you grow as your application or your business needs grow. And block storage is another one of those. Each uh, LightSail instance that um, you spin up includes its own highly available SSD storage, but there are times when you might need more disk space. Um, you can allocate additional storage volumes or disks that you can then attach to your LightSail instances. Um, those volumes can be up to 16 terabytes per disk. Uh, they're encrypted by default, and we use uh, SSD drives, which provide a, a really good balance of price and performance for you. So you can continue to grow. You can use CDNs, you can use databases, you can use load balancing and block storage to help grow your application. Um, but you may want to grow even further than that. And we also provide the ability for you to access all of the uh, services and features available on AWS through VPC peering. So you may decide that you need to uh, grow beyond what's offered by LightSail. You might want to use another service on AWS like Elastic File System or Elastic Cache. And you can do that from your application uh, through VPC peering. You create a peer to back to the AWS account, and then you can access those services uh, through there. In addition, um, you may decide at some point that you want to migrate to EC2, that you need the, the, the power of all the features and capabilities of EC2, and you want more granular control over your application and infrastructure, and you want to take over some of the management of that we provide a, an upgrade path for you. You can very easily create a snapshot of your LightSail instance, uh, and then follow a step-by-step -step, uh, guide in the LightSail console to move that snapshot over to EC2, create an EC2 instance based on that snapshot, or now Amazon machine image, and build out your infrastructure over there. So, there's, uh, there are all different kinds of paths for you. You may decide to stay on LightSail. You may want to grow into AWS proper, or you may want to move there completely. Um, so to close out uh, this intro to LightSail, I just want to add, add a couple of things. One of the, 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 the primary use cases for LightSail and some of the more popular workloads that we see focus really around you know, simple web applications where you want to deploy a web app like a you know, LAMP stack or an Nginx stack, um, Node.js, we make it super easy for you to get your web application online with LightSail. Uh, websites, very quickly create um, websites using WordPress or Magento or Django or what have you. You can have a website with, as I mentioned before, a WordPress website, for example, up and running and online and available to your customers in just a matter of minutes. You can also run open source software and commercial software on LightSail instances for your business. Um, you can quickly launch like line of business software, 
file storage, file sharing, backups, uh, finance, accounting software, and much more, and run all of that on LightSail. And one of my favorites and where I use LightSail a, a lot is in dev and test environments. I very frequently spin up uh, dev environments, use them as a dev sandbox or a test environment outside of a production environment. That way I can test and build things without fear of um, breaking something in production. So with that, uh, I think I'll close out the, the intro to LightSail and move on to containers for the topic of the day. Um, LightSail containers were just introduced last year at reInvent. And like LightSail is the easy way to get on the cloud, LightSail containers are an easy way to run containers in the cloud. And as Stuart brought up in his question, it, it, we've taken sort of best, best practices and common use cases and produced a, a simplified container experience that allows you know, new cloud users, uh, new container users, new developers to very quickly move containerized applications to the cloud. And again, at a very predictable price. That probably sounds familiar, but that's one of the core and fundamental themes of LightSail. LightSail containers uh, were designed using the same core principles of LightSail. We want to make it simple. We want to make it easy to use, and we want to provide fixed, predictable pricing. LightSail containers are also built on the same reliable services, uh, AWS services like ECS and Fargate and ECR, ELB and Route 53, those services that you have, uh, you may have already heard about and used before. So I'm going to talk about light cell containers, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of, of three areas, sort of key concepts. The first is uh, container services, and the next will be uh, really container deployments, and then I'll talk briefly about container images. I think you'll find that uh, light cell can uh, containers are very easy and, and simple to use. Um, so to get started, when I talk about light cell containers, you, you have to start talking about container services, and that's really sort of this um, uh, compute resource that is located somewhere and has a certain capacity. And with light cell container services, we actually deploy containers to those services using uh, deployments using familiar uh, Docker uh, images. So let's, uh, let's take a second and I'll familiarize us with what container services is and, and we'll talk about each one of these. Um, so a, a container service is, I, I really think about it in two different ways. It's, it's a, a location, where are you going to run your containers, and it's a capacity. And um, like Light sale containers are available in, I, I believe we're in 13 regions now. Um, and you choose a region to run your containers on, similar to how you would choose a region if you were spinning up a light sale instance. You want to choose a region that is um, either close to you if you're going to be using that container service. So in my case, Oregon is, is the closest region to me, and I would choose that for my my light cell container services, or I might choose a region that's close to my customers. So if I'm providing a service that external customers might be using, um, I want to perhaps put it in a region that's close to them. You may also have some other reasons for choosing a region like data sovereignty, or you may need to run your applications in a particular geography. Uh, either way, choose you. Cho the first step is choosing a, a region where you want to run your containers. Once you've decided where to locate your container service, it's time to decide on what your capacity requirements are. And in the context of light sale containers, capacity is really the product of two things, power and, and scale. The more power and scale you have, the more capacity your container service will have. Power itself, uh, is defined by the size of the compute node you choose. And for example, here on your screen, you'll see I've chosen a small node size, one that includes uh, a gigabyte of RAM and a half of a virtual CPU. If I wanted more power, I could choose a large node size. 
uh, which includes four times the power of the small node, four gigs of RAM, and two VCP, vCPUs, and so on. Um, as you increase the power of the node, the uh, cost of the node increases. As you decrease the power of the node, cost goes down. More power, more cost, less power, less cost. Um, the second thing that you can, that, that determines the capacity of your light cell container service is scale. And the scale of your service determines the uh, number of nodes that you'll have. And, and again, in this case, I've chosen uh, to launch my service with two nodes, meaning I'll have twice the capacity as I would have with a, with a single node. And scale, it does determine capacity. It also helps determine the resilience and availability of your container service as well. The more nodes you have, the less impact the failure of a single node will have on your service. A single node or a scale of one would be considered a single point of failure. If that node fails, your, um, your service fails with it. You can change the power of your container service anytime after it's been created. Uh, when, you, when you do so, the nodes powering your service will be updated and uh, will be replaced with no downtime to your container service, making sure that your customers who are using it um, have a happy experience. Uh, changing the power of your container service like this is considered vertical scaling, and you can increase or decrease the, the power of your service as, as you might, uh, as you see fit. Um, Sorry, Jerry, just yeah. a quick question yeah. on the on the pricing. Is that mm -hmm. based um, per month, uh, the, the cost of those nodes, or over what kind of period is that? Yes, filled? that's per node per month. Okay. Yep. So it, it, it makes it really easy to, you can plan and very predictably uh, determine what your cost is going to be for a, a particular container service per month. You can say this is exactly what it's going to cost. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> yeah, no, good question. Thanks. Um, so you can also horizontally scale your capacity of your container service after you've created it. You can change the number of nodes uh, as you see fit. And for example, if you uh, if you knew that your service was going to need extra capacity for some planned event, you could increase the scale of the service before the event to accommodate the increased traffic, you know, increase the number of nodes from two to five to 10, for example. And then once the event had passed, you could decrease the, uh, uh, the number of nodes, decrease the scale back to normal levels. Um, you can quickly con uh, create container services through the LightSail web console and the, the screenshots that I've shown as I've been talking about this are were based on that console. But you can also very easily do this through the AWS command line interface. Um, and I sh I've shown an example here on the screen. It, it's really a simple call. And I'll demonstrate this uh, later on when we uh, do some more demos. But speaking of demos, um, I'm going to go a little bit off script here, and I'm actually going to demo creating a, a light cell container service right now, just to show you how how easy it is. So I'm going to open up my um, my web browser here, and you can see on your screen that I have I've already created some uh, containers on the Amazon light cell content or console, like any good. Uh, uh, webinar cook. I've pre-cooked a couple of these just to make sure we're ready. <laughs> uh, uh, but so I'm going to create a container service and you'll see exactly what you just saw there. Uh, to create a container service, I'm going to choose an AWS region. In my case, as I mentioned, Oregon is the closest to me. So I'm going to choose that region. And then I'm going to choose a container service capacity. And I'll go with the default here because we're going to use it for the webinar and I have a couple of simple containers to deploy. So I don't need a lot of capacity. I'm just going to use a micro uh, node size and a scale for one. I'll go down here and let's give it a, an intuitive name like webinar. Um, give it a name and you can see the default domain beneath that. Uh, when I want to reach this uh, service, I'll, I'll go through that domain. It'll have a random GUID in it review what I've just created here and 
create my container service. So that may take a minute or two to create, but that's that's all that's involved. That you know, I didn't talk about clusters, I didn't talk about orchestration. All of that is handled for you. So I'll switch back to the uh, presentation again, and we'll come back to that uh, uh, that container service in just a minute. Um, but first, I want to talk about deployments. Um, deployments are one of the another of the key concepts and once you create a container service you'll probably interact more with deployments than with the service itself other than um, changing the capacity of it so let's talk a bit about deployments too and uh, deployments are associated with a container service and really define the containers that are going to be in that service and how they interact with one another and how they interact with the outside world. Um, any deployment to a container service can be composed of one or more containers up to 10. And if you've worked with containers before, the things I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides will probably be very familiar. Uh, first, every container in the deployment needs a unique name. Uh, one that, you know, I choose container names that are easily recognizable so that I can see them later on. So in this case, if I was going to spin up a, an Nginx container, for example, I wanted to build a reverse proxy and use Nginx for that. I might call it Nginx or I might call it web or what have you, something that, that I'll recognize. We'll see those later in um, container logs. Uh, next up, I'll provide an image reference. So this is that container image that you're going to use to uh, for this particular container. And each container in a deployment needs a source image. So we, you know, we need to decide where is that image going to be located? Is it going to be in a public repository like repository like Docker Hub? Or was it uploaded to the LightSail container service itself? Right now, by just typing in Nginx here, that means by default, I'm going to use the master Nginx container image that's contained on Docker Hub. Um, this can be an image that you've built yourself, like, or be a public image, like I just mentioned from Nginx. And I'll I'll show you examples of what these two things look like later during the demo. In addition to container name and image, which are the required uh, parameters, you can also provide optional parameters like a launch command. Um, that you want to use when your container is run. For example, you might want to run a particular script or another executable and provide command line arguments. Uh, you may, may also need to provide environmental, environmental variables that your container uses it at runtime. So these are key value pairs that you can use to provide runtime config to your container. You know, for example, I commonly uh, use like host name and port uh, for containers so that I can provide the information for a downstream service provider that the container might use during operation. So in addition to launch commands and environmental variables, um, you can also specify open ports that your container will listen to. So for example, here our Nginx container, it's going to be listening on port 80 uh, and using standard which is the standard HTTP port, but you can also specify other protocols and ports uh, depending on what your container is and what it does. You may want to specify H that you're going to be listening for HTTPS traffic on port 443 or uh, UDP or TCP traffic that your container is going to use. Uh, these ports are exposed by LightSail the LightSail container service and are reachable by other LightSail container services, so you could communicate from one container to another over, over these ports. Um, these parameters like name and image and command and variables and ports can all be specified when you create a container service using the console like I've just shown here, or you can also do the same thing using the AWS command line interface. So here's an example of a a deployment that I created in a configuration that includes multiple containers. Here, there's a an Nginx uh, container that is acting as a reverse proxy and a Flask um, app container. And it shows how the different configuration options here. You can see the uh, you know the image specified here, 
the ports that I'm going to open on Nginx. It's going to expose port 80. And I'm passing in some environment variables like the Flask host and the Flask port. And then the, uh, the second container is the Flask container, and it's listening on port 5000. So very uh, straightforward to do, very, um, very simple. And as I mentioned, if you've worked with containers before, these are all simple or uh, probably recognizable concepts. In addition to uh, specifying the details about the container itself, you can also indicate that a deployment is publicly accessible, and you do that through the use of a public endpoint. And what that means is you select a one of the containers in your deployment that is going to act as the public endpoint. It has to be exposing a port. In this case, I've chosen Nginx, and um, it will listen on port 80 and the container service will route traffic from the, uh, the public domain to that port, to that container. And um, then you can, so you could route you know, web traffic or what have you to your container or a particular container. The container service will monitor that container using this health check. This is a simple health check here. The default is just the, uh, um, the route, but you could also provide and do deep health checks or shallow health checks, depending on what your application, um, what your application requirements are. And again, using the uh, looking at it from the perspective of the command line interface, here's the JSON data structure and how you would specify that uh, uh, public endpoint um, using JSON. And I'll, I'll show you another example of this later on in one of the demos. All right, so finally, uh, before we get into demos, uh, I'll just talk briefly about images. And if you're, if you're new to uh, container images, um, this is probably one of the first places that you'll go. One of the first things that you'll do uh, is, is look at, at Docker files and such to build out uh, containers. LightSail container services use Docker container images in deployments. Uh, you can use, as I mentioned previously, uh, container images that are in public repositories like Docker Hub, or you can build your own custom images and push them to LightSail using the CLI. And I'll demonstrate uh, both of these techniques in, in just a minute. And Docker containers are built using Docker files like the one you see here, which uh, is actually a copy of one I'll use in the demo. Um, so pretty straightforward. There, there's the, the concepts are simple. It, we've made it really easy to use. You can launch and have a container running in the cloud in just a matter of minutes. And I'm going to show you how quickly you can do that uh, uh, very shortly. So I hope this was a, a useful introduction to LightSail. If you want to know uh, in LightSail containers, if you want to know more about LightSail containers, uh, we've got a lot of information on the uh, LightSail product page and the LightSail containers documentation. So now let me switch gears and I'm going to do uh, a couple of demos to demonstrate some of the key concepts and fundamental activities that you'll do with LightSail containers. Um, I'll really focus on three, and we've done one of them already, number one, which is create a container service. Uh, and then what I'll do next is I'm going to deploy a public container to show you how easy it is to launch a, a container that's already in a public repository. Um, and then I'll show you how, uh, I'll demonstrate how to deploy your own container. So we'll go to the command line and build the container and then go back to, and push it up to LightSail and then go back to the LightSail console and launch it there. And then for the, the number four here, the final demo, I'm gonna deploy multiple containers and I'm gonna do all of that from the command line and then we'll go back to the console and, and see it. So with that, let me switch back to our, um, our console and we can see here, uh, let's walk through this real quick. So this is the webinar, um, container service that I created. You can see now the status is ready. Uh, we can look at capacity. And as I mentioned previously, 
once the container service has been created, you can go in and change capacity at any time. I could go in here right now and change and choose a different, you know, a small, medium, large, or what have you, and uh, make those changes in the background light cell would spin up those new nodes and get them up and running and then transfer traffic over to it. Uh, we can also specify custom domains. Right now, we're, we're using this public domain that LightSail has created for us, which is webinar dot some random uh, uh, characters, and we'll use that, but you could provide a custom domain for it. And I, I want to show this briefly. Uh, you also have access to metrics. Now, there's no activity in this service yet, so there's nothing there, but you can see you can see CPU utilization and memory utilization. All right, so for this, um, uh, for this first example, I'm going to create a my first deployment, and I'm going to create. I'm just going to use the public uh, nginx container. So I'm giving my container a name, and I'm going to say here, use the nginx container. And what this does is this by default will go to Docker Hub, get the master nginx container, whatever the latest version is, and use it for for this container. Now, since I this is a web server, I'm going to specify that it's going to be listening on uh, port 80. And I'm also going now to specify a public endpoint. So this container is listening on port 80. I want LightSail to route traffic that arrives at the public domain um, to this particular port. And it's already configured. And I'm going to leave the rest as the default port 80 and the default health check is fine. I'm going to do a save and deploy. That's as easy as it is and as quick as it is to deploy a public container um, to, to LightSail. Now, as I mentioned, I've already cooked some of these in the background, so I'm going to go back to the uh, LightSail uh, container page, and this is the same one uh, that already has that deployed. Uh, we can see that we've uh, deployed the Nginx um, container image version 1.19.2. We have port 80 open and the public endpoint is set up on port 80 using the HTTP protocol. Uh, very quickly, I'll open up the log so we can see that. And you can see here now, really the only traffic on it is a health check that's coming into it, but you have full access to log information and you can configure it and filter logs as your um, as you're configuring your application and building it. Uh, so let's do a quick test on it. Uh, we'll open up that domain and you can see here, there is, this is what the default Nginx container does. It acts as a web server and it returns a simple um, uh, HTML page. So that shows that it's working. But what if you wanna do uh, something a, a little more complex? What if you wanted to, this shows how to deploy a publicly available container. Um, something that's a little more useful would be to build our own container and deploy that container instead. So let me switch and I'll go over to a, um, a development environment where I've already set it up to build a Flask container. So Flask is a Python framework, a web common web framework that, that runs in, um, in Flask. And uh, I won't go into any great detail here, but you can see on the screen, here's the app file. It's very simple. Um, it has one route. And when it gets a request on that route, it's simply going to return this HTML that I've specified up above here. And when this application is run, it's going to be listening on port 5000. So uh, the, the Docker file itself is pretty standard using a Python Alpine image. So it's slim and trim, doesn't include a lot of uh, non-essentials. And other than that, it really just sets the application up and copies the app.py file over into the application folder. And then at runtime, it will run Python and uh, give it a, a parameter of app.py so it runs the application. So I'm going to uh, build 
this container and call it flask container. And I've built it previously, so that will run pretty quickly. So we've created that image locally using the Docker file. Now the next step I need to do is push this image up to Amazon uh, LightSail. And I'm gonna do that with this command here, AWS LightSail push container image. I'm gonna provide it with the uh, name of the service, which is webinar, and I'm going to label it Flask container, and I'm gonna use the uh, Flask container image. And once that is done, this will push it up. Uh, I've already done this before, so it goes pretty quickly. The one thing I wanna point out here is when this image is pushed up, it's given a, a name or an identifier. And in this case, webinar flask container 19. And that's important, we wanna save that. So now, now that I've pushed that image up to flask, I'm gonna switch back to my uh, console. I'm gonna go back to my webinar uh, container service. And I'm going to, I'm gonna modify this, this deployment that's already up there. Right now it's just an Nginx container. I'm gonna modify it and replace it with, let's say, let's call this flask. I'm going to simply replace what's there. The image that I'm gonna specify is that image that was just created. So this tells the uh, container service to use an image that's stored in Amazon LightSail. We're not using a public image um, at this point. I'm gonna change the open ports. Flask actually listens on port 5000 instead of port 80. And the light cell container service will take care of mapping requests that come in on port 80 to port 5000 in this container. And it automatically reconfigured the public endpoint for me and specified that the Flask container is going to be used and it's gonna be using uh, port 5000. So I'm gonna save and deploy this, and you can see here that it's deploying. Now I wanted to call out here, now you can see deployment versions. This makes it really easy, for example, if I wanted to go back and modify and redeploy a particular version or roll back to a particular version. So we keep track of these versions and allow you to modify them directly or roll back to them. Now again, I have a pre-built version of this container, so I'm just gonna switch over to it just to show you what the output is. If I, uh, this one has already been deployed, and but you can see it was configured the same, port 5000, flask container. If I go to the uh, pre-built public domain for this, you'll see, hey, there's my flask container, welcome to Amazon LightSail. So it's actually working. Um, so, that, uh, that shows you really quickly how to deploy your own container so you can build a container on the command line, you can push it up to LightSail. And what if you wanna do all of that from the command line? Um, so I will uh, show you this last demo uh, fairly quickly. I'll switch back to another project that I have um, already built and um, do very similar to what we just did before. This project is again, very simple. Um, I have a, a, an Nginx reverse proxy that I'm going to build and run in a container. That reverse proxy, all it really does is um, proxy that request back to the Flask container. So it's not doing something super useful here, but it demonstrates how we can connect two containers together. I'm gonna provide the host name and the port used for that upstream Flask server via uh, environmental variables, like I mentioned before, and I'll do that in the JSON data structure that I've used before. And we can see that here in the uh, the Nginx container, which I've called web here. We're passing in the Flask host, which is local host. They're gonna be running on the same, um, same uh, container service node and the port. The application itself on the back end, the second container is again, another Flask container. It looks very similar to the previous one except I've added a little text here to say that this is part of the multi-container demo. Um, back to the containers, Jason, uh, I briefly touched on this earlier. This is where we're gonna specify the same things that we would specify in the LightSail console, but from the command line in JSON. So here I have two separate uh, containers. 
the front end, which is the web container that's a, an Nginx container that's acting as a reverse proxy, and then the back end, the app container, which is a, uh, a Flask container that's going to be listening on port 5000. Um, I'm also going to create a public endpoint. We're going to use the web container name, and it's going to be listening on port 80. So I'm going to go down here to the command line, and I'm going to uh, build the Flask container. And then I'm going to build the um, Nginx container. I'm going to push both of those to the uh, webinar service. So here's the Nginx container. I'm going to build it and push it. And like before, I need to grab the, the identifier right here and go back up here and update this image so that when we deploy this, it knows which image to use. And I'm going to do the same thing for um, the uh, Flask container. And then I'll grab that identifier for the Flask container and place it up in the configuration file again. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to actually deploy this um, to our webinar container service. And on the command line here, you can see um, I'm specifying the service name, which is webinar. I'm specifying the containers uh, information, this file here, so it knows what containers to build. And I'm also specifying the public endpoint, so it knows how to expose this to the world. So here again, I'm going to ask our container service to deploy it. It's going to give me some information back. And at this point, we'll go back to the console and, and look at what's in the console. So now I, I can see from the console now, if I go to this webinar uh, container service, I can see that it's currently being deployed. And the status is deploying. I can see that there are. Uh, two containers included in this service, the app container. It, here's the image that it's going to be used. That's an image that is stored on LightSail, and it's going to be um, listening or exposing uh, port 80 as a public endpoint. I wanted to also go to this tab here. Now you can see on the container service, you can see the images that we've actually pushed up there, and you can maintain or manage those yourself, keep them around. Here are the latest two. Um, that I just created and pushed. And uh, so let's go back to the, I already have a pre-baked one of these to, um, to show you this is the, this is the same, uh, this is the same container service, same images. And now I can go to the public domain and we can see that this, you can see this text. If you see this page, the multi-container demo is working correctly. So this demonstrates that we're able to stitch those two containers together very easily. I can go back in and make updates to them or um, make any changes to them uh, later on as, as I see fit. All right, so that was a real quick introduction to LightSail containers, a, a quick introduction to, or some demos of how to use uh, LightSail containers and an introduction to LightSail itself. So I hope that was uh, useful for everyone. I, I want to close by showing this, uh, you know, one last thing that I want to leave with you, and that is uh, when should you use LightSail containers? So LightSail containers were built for um, uh, someone who is new and wants to learn about building containers in the cloud. Maybe you're a student or a developer or a hobbyist and you just want to learn about using containers in the cloud, or you want to gain experience running containers in the cloud. So maybe you, you, you have experience using Docker um, on your local dev machine or um, using your own infrastructure, but you want to gain experience moving containers to the cloud. LightSail Containers was designed for that. Or you may be an experienced cloud container user and be experienced with other services like ECS and EKS and, and Fargate and Elastic Beanstalk, but you just need a simple container orchestration 
a service and you don't need all of the other options and you don't need visibility into the underlying infrastructure. That's a great use case for light sail containers. There are cases where you should use EKS, uh, EKS and ECS and Fargate instead if you need advanced orchestration uh, or if you have or advanced orchestration needs, you might need service mesh, et cetera. That's a good uh, opportunity to look at those other services or if you need if you have very specific compute needs with different CPU RAM combinations or you need GPUs etc or you have advanced networking or security needs or you you need uh, granular access to the underlying uh, resources then you should look at those others but for um, if you're new to the cloud new to containers or don't need all of the, uh, the bells and whistles, then LightSail is a great fit for that. So I hope this has been used for you, uh, useful for you. I've had fun presenting this. It was fun building this webinar for you. Uh, I think at this point, uh, I want to thank everybody and uh, invite Stuart back, and we can do some Q and A if you have any questions about the things that I've talked about or where to go for more information. Yes, yeah, so there's uh, there's plenty of questions that are coming, Jerry. Thank you very much for going through the presentation. It was it was awesome. It was good to see uh, how it's configured and deployed from both uh, the console and the command line as well. So thank you very much for for going through them. Okay, so time for Q and A. So I'm just going to kind of run through some of the different questions that have come in. Um, first up, I have a question here. Can we run Windows containers on LightSail? Uh, and what about MS SQL instances as well? Currently, only Linux containers are supported. Um, that's a uh, some feedback we've gotten from customers, and we're looking to see what we can do and how we can uh, build that infrastructure out. But right now, um, uh, Linux containers, you can run uh, Windows instances on LightSail itself, so if you need to run Windows Server, but uh, right now, just Linux containers. Okay, excellent. Um, another question, is LightSail for people who don't want or need an event-driven infrastructure and just want to run small monolithic architectures like traditional servers? Absolutely, it's it's really, um, and that's where I find myself using LightSail containers uh, for, uh, in, in general, is I have very simple container needs. I, I have a an application or a containerized application that, maybe pre-existing and I just want to, I want to run it in the cloud, I want to realize the benefits of the cloud, and I want to, I, I, I like the the low predictable pricing of of light cell containers. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you don't need to re-architect, if you don't need to move to an event-driven architecture, if you have a legacy application, for example, that you've containerized, um, that's a great opportunity to put it up into LightSail and, and run it there. Brilliant. Um, just scrolling through here. So we have another question. Um, is this an alternative to EC2? Um, and with this, is there a limitation that apps can only be deployed to dev and test environments? No, there's um, so I'll answer the last question or the last part of the question first. No, not it's not restricted to dev and test, um, but you have to look at the workload and determine if light sale is appropriate for your particular workload. And if you have specific, as I mentioned before, if you have specific or sustained CPU requirements, or you need GPUs, or um, you need access to other underlying features then you should consider looking at EC2. Uh, and you can you can run, um, you, there are a variety of other places to run containers on AWS. Uh, managed services like ECS and EKS are great places to go. Uh, Fargate for a, a hands-off serverless approach to containers. Um, or uh, you can, run containers on EC2 directly and maintain and manage your own infrastructure, but that requires you to administer and manage it and do all the grunt work of building it out and um, monitoring it and uh, operating it. Uh, I like to think of 
of light sail containers is if you if you really don't need all of those things, uh, if you yeah. don't need that level of granular control over your infrastructure, then you should use light sail uh, light sail containers. At, at some point, you may need more control over it, and that's a great that's a perfect segue into you know moving to one of the other container services, and that's exactly what we expect customers to do. So someone's asking, um, what's the best way to migrate some lightweight Windows EC2 instances to LightSail for specific use cases? And is there a migration tool to do that? So this is this is regarding LightSail um, proper and not LightSail containers, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 You you have to really look at what uh, you can see what um, Windows servers are available on LightSail. And make sure that 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 particular um, particular server and type and capability suits your needs. We've seen a a, a lot of small and medium sized businesses moving Windows infrastructure over to LightSail because it is again simple to use, uh, predictable pricing, um, but your your mileage is going to vary, and that 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 really applies not just to Windows, but to Linux workloads as well, that um, if you have very, again, I'm, I feel I'm repeating myself, but it's, it's important to do so. If you have very specific um, workloads with very specific CPU requirements or GPU requirements or what have you, then you, you wanna look at the uh, cost performance trade-off and evaluate both sides and look at what the cost and what your capabilities you're gonna get from Lightsail sure. and, what you would get from EC2, and we find many customers who are moving to LightSail because it fits, you know, it fits their needs, provides a very simple and easy to use interface, and is very cost effective and very predictable. When you look at, you know, when you look at your bill at the end of the month, um, the LightSail bill is is very simple. Great, thanks, Jerry. We'll just mm -hmm. take a couple more questions before we, before we finish up. And um, we have a question here: Do the containers talk to each other in a multi-container environment? Absolutely, you can. As I um, uh, in the demo I showed, I, I showed a real simple example, and that was a an nginx uh, container proxying request to the Flask container on the back end, and um, the it, it, like other container environments. If you're familiar with using like Docker Compose or other uh, 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 ways or methods of building these out, you specify which ports your container are listening on. The underlying infrastructure, in this case, um, uh, light cell containers exposes that port, and then other containers within that same service can communicate directly with with that. Um, with that other container that's exposing that port. In this case, it was uh, Nginx talking to Flask over port 5000. Great, thank you. Um, and is there a free tier just to try these things out of what you discussed today? Yes, there there certainly is. And I, I skimmed right over the page and didn't mention it, um, <laughs> but I should, I should, well, I could switch back, but yeah, yeah, there is. And the same is true for LightSail as well. Um, it, it, it's easy to use, inexpensive to use. Uh, you have the ability to try it out and and make sure it fits your needs. But I I, I didn't mention, but it was on one of the slides. Like the the uh, sure. the least expensive light sale instance is three dollars and fifty cents a month, and so it's very economical to if you have a simple website you want to put up a blog, uh, you can do it very inexpensively. Great, thank you. I mean, we, we have uh, quite a few other more questions, so we'll try and get answers to those and, and get them out to people that have registered uh, to the webinar. Um, but before we close this webinar off, I just want to highlight a, a brand new lab that has been created uh, by Logan, our, our lead labs developer here at Cloud Academy. That will allow you to get hands on with the topics that Jerry has been discussing today. So it's a really great way to learn um, like about light cell containers and it will enable you to go over some of the areas um, covered today for, for yourself. So please just, just go check it out, have a play uh, and enjoy light cell containers. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us today and a special thanks to Jerry for 
a great presentation and demonstration. It was uh, interesting to see this relatively new feature of, of light sail with the containers. I think you said it was released during reInvent um, and the ins and outs of how it was, how it was configured. So yeah, th thank you very much, Joe. Do you have any cl closing remarks that you'd like to like to say? No, thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, if I invite everybody to try out LightSail and LightSail containers. If you have any questions, comments, I'm AWS Geek on Twitter, and as you mentioned earlier, awsgeek.com. You'll see all the diagrams and things that I've been working on. Yeah, and we have some great questions coming. It shows show, show that this service is is very much on, on people's agenda, uh, an area of interest, which is which is good to see. Uh, just a final reminder to everyone: you'll receive the recording via email as soon as as it's available. And don't forget to check out our lab and all of our webinars, which you can find on our website at cloudacademy.com. So thank you again, Jerry, and goodbye.